Good morning to everybody. Uh, I want to introduce now Professor uh, John Barrow, uh, who is uh, one of the most outstanding scientists in uh, both cosmology and uh, mathematics. Uh, he's also a brilliant uh, playwright. In fact, he uh, won a prize uh, in Italy uh, for one of his uh, uh, plays, which is named Infinities. Um, he, after his uh, first degree in uh, mathematics and physics at uh, the University of Durham, he completed his uh, doctorate in astrophysics uh, at Magdalen College in Oxford. Now he teaches in the University of Cambridge. Um, he has published uh, more than 480 papers in international journals uh, and is also author of uh, 17 uh, books uh, under a more divulgative uh, um, um, type of uh, uh, issue. Um, he is author, for instance, of the Anthropic Cosmological Principle, or the left hand of creation. Uh, uh, to summarize his incredible uh, work, uh, it's not so easy, but uh, we would like to uh, even tell that uh, he is president of the um, in international, uh, um, uh, he's, he has also lectured in, uh, in Downing Street uh, number 10 in Windsor Castle in the Vatican and also to the general public, including uh, now uh, Foligno. Uh, he also deals with uh, education because uh, he's uh, um, uh, trying to uh, uh, make uh, uh, mathematics more understandable to uh, high school students like uh, the great majority of the uh, listeners that now are in this uh, room. Uh, he's also a member of the United Reformed Church, which he describes as teaching a traditional deistic picture of the universe. Uh, so he's uh, really a rich person, uh, both under the scientific point of view and uh, human and uh, spiritual. And uh, uh, I think we are very uh, glad and uh, honored to have him uh, here in uh, Foligno today. And I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, him with uh, an applause. Of course, I Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to spend uh, this lecture today trying to tell you something of the unusual and perhaps for you unexpected applications of mathematics. Many people ask what is mathematics? Is it invented? Is it discovered? And there are whole departments of philosophy at universities uh, that try to answer this question in a complicated way. For us, I think the most useful definition of mathematics is that it is the collection of all possible patterns. Some of those patterns are rather physical, like the uh, design on the ceiling of this room. But others may be patterns of events in time. They may be shapes or symmetries. They may be computational patterns that follow electronically but they are all patterns. And it then becomes no mystery as to why mathematics is so useful, why it always seems to work as a description of the world. The world must contain patterns, or there could be no evolution of life, there could be no us. It would be a complete chaos. And so mathematics must exist as a description of those patterns. Well, the first uh, thing I'm going to do is to tell you about a lot of separate, different topics that use different types of mathematics, so that you can get some appreciation of how mathematics operates in subjects that you wouldn't perhaps have suspected that it had anything to say. And the first is rather mundane. It's about electricity pylons. If you drive through the countryside in England, and probably in Italy as well, you will see many of these electricity pylons. There was a rather strange website 
uh, in Britain for many years, which was called Pylon of the Month, where a student would put up each month a photograph of what he claimed was an interesting electricity pylon. Well, the interesting thing about the pylons is that you notice that they are made of triangles. They are like great totem poles of triangles. So why are they made uh, of triangles and not other subjects, other shapes? Well, if you look at different types of structure uh, and make the outlines out of struts and bolt them together, <clears throat> the triangular shape is unique. It is the only shape which is rigid. So that if you try to make a structure from four straight lines in the shape of a square, then if you distort it and stress it slightly, you can change it into a parallelogram which is rather similar in shape. So it will distort and it will buckle. But the triangle cannot be distorted. It is the only one of these polygonal shapes which is rigid. So sometimes in the country you will see that someone has made a gate, a rectangular gate, but they will put across it a diagonal strut to divide it into two triangles because this is more rigid than the rectangular shape. In fact, if one then looks in three dimensions, uh, there is a whole branch of mathematics which will then study what are the rigid structures uh, in three dimensions and even in higher dimensions. So this is a simple geometrical issue uh, aimed at something that you see in real life. Another thing that you may see around in the marketplace or elsewhere is something that's fairly universal in nature. It's a desire to have objects and structures which have a relatively small volume and weight but a very large surface area. And this vegetable, you can see, is trying to do that. It's trying to have a lot of surface. The human lung is another structure which has a network makeup so that it has lots of surface for a very small volume. The human brain is rather similar. It's like a piece of scrambled up paper. This is a snowflake. Here is a tree, a piece of coral. This is the design for one of Leonardo da Vinci's chapels. And again, he wants to have uh, lots of side chapels. It has a symmetry, a rotational symmetry, like a wheel. But he is adding lots of interface, lots of boundary for the same overall area. This is the skin of an elephant. And it's not smooth, so it's very rough, and it has hills and valleys and lines. One of the purposes of that is to enable it to have much more surface area than it would if it was smooth and covering the same region. And here is a mathematical structure called the Cox snowflake, which deliberately increases uh, the boundary uh, of this region. So what's going on here? Why do structures want to do that? Well, the surface is usually where uh, something that's living ingests air, if it's a tree, uh, or if it's the human lung system, it wants to have lots of networks uh, to spread air throughout the living system. If it's a coral, it wants to absorb nutrients from the sea, and it will absorb more if it has a larger surface area. In the case of the elephant, the strategy is to keep cool. If you are a large animal, your main problem is that you generate heat internally proportional to your volume. But you can only keep cool at a rate that's proportional to your surface area. And because your volume grows faster than your area, as you get bigger, if you try to be an animal that's too big in a tropical climate, you will overheat. So you have to find a way 
to have more surface area to keep cool. And the elephant skin does it by having these crenellations. It has a much bigger surface than you would expect. If you want to live at the North Pole, you also want to be big. So you generate lots of heat. But you don't want lots of surface because you don't want to lose heat by cooling. So near the North Pole, you find lots of very large animals, very large birds in northern climates, not small ones. So in this whole business, you can see this competition as to how to have uh, a very large surface area without having a large volume and weight is carried through by this type of mathematical construction which keeps enlarging your surface without adding huge volume. There is one very practical problem uh, in real life that we see this type of consideration coming into play. Suppose we have a large rectangular sheet of paper, so this is joined together. Then the boundary is this distance plus this plus this plus this. If we cut it in half, down the middle, we make the boundary bigger because we create two new pieces of boundary. So if you keep cutting this in half, making it into smaller and smaller pieces, you will create more and more boundary, more and more surface. And so this is why dust is very dangerous uh, as a source of fire. People often wonder why this should be. So why is dust particularly inflammable? Uh, in Britain many years ago, there was a terrible fire at King's Cross Station in London that was caused primarily by build-up of dust. And you see, if you have paper stored in a warehouse, you break it into smaller pieces, there's a lot more surface area. If you break it down into particles of dust, there is vastly more surface area. And the fire burns on the surface because that is where the oxygen is in contact with the paper. So a pile of dust is much more dangerous as a source of fire than the huge piece of paper that created it. And again, the problem is large surface area is being created by this division. Well, let's move on and look at some problems of mechanics uh, and mathematics in sport uh, and gymnastics. This is something that you will have seen. This is Stefan Holm. He was the Olympic champion in the high jump in Athens. Uh, in, uh, and he's jumped uh, not very far off 2 meters 36, 2 meters 38. Uh, this is remarkable. It's, a, it's an Olympic medal winning uh, performance, but it's even more remarkable because Stefan Holm is only my height. Okay, most high jumpers are two meters tall or, or bigger. Even women can be that tall. So only one other person has ever jumped further above the height of their head uh, than Holm. But the technique being used here uh, is an unusual one. It was invented in 1968 by Dick Fosbury. So what is going on here uh, from the point of view of mathematics? Well, if you think about high jumping from uh, the point of view of engineering and physics, what is happening is that you are approaching the bar with some energy of motion, kinetic energy, as mathematicians would call it, and then you have to convert it into potential energy your weight times your height to clear the bar. But what is that height that you can convert your energy of motion into? What that height is, is the distance which you can increase the height of your center of gravity. So our center of gravity is about here. And so if you increase it to cross the bar, uh, that's how you use your energy. When you're in school and you're very young, you use a different high jumping technique just called scissors, where you just sort of hop over the bar. That's very inefficient 
because your center of gravity goes well over the bar. You have to use a lot of energy to clear the bar. But the remarkable thing about this Fosbury flop technique uh, and the straddle technique that preceded it as well is that your center of gravity goes under the bar. So when you have a curve shape like my hand here, the center of gravity of this curve lies somewhere in here. It doesn't lie on the curve. And so what Stefan Holm is doing is sending his center of gravity under the bar even though his body is going over the bar. If you watch pole vaulters, you'll see exactly the same technique. They go over the bar in this inverted U shape. They roll over the bar, so their center of gravity is going underneath. The next type of problem like this uh, that people often think is about center of gravity, but in fact is not. If you see pictures of uh, tightrope walkers, this is a very old picture. This gentleman, uh, Philippe Petit, is walking between the twin towers uh, that were destroyed uh, in New York, of course, in 2001. So he had erected a tightrope wire between these two skyscrapers and is walking between. And like people in the circus, he's carrying a long pole. So the question is, why do you carry a long pole when you're trying to balance on the wire? So I once stopped people at the university in Cambridge and asked them why they thought you carried the long pole. And some people said, oh, it's to lower your center of gravity so that it's more stable. But in fact, the pole raises your center of gravity makes it worse. So it's not about center of gravity. It's about something uh, a little more subtle than that. It's about the distribution of your mass. And this is what engineers and mathematicians call your inertia, or your moment of inertia. So when you're interested in moving something, it's not just its weight that counts but it's how the weight is distributed within the object. So if you want to move something that's uh, like this, it's like a ring or a shell in three dimensions, so all the mass is a long way from the center and it is hollow, you will find it much harder to move than if it is a solid uniform sphere of the same mass and the same diameter would have to be made of different material. So in this case, there is lots of mass far from the center. In this case, it's evenly distributed. So the inertia, just like the ordinary use of this uh, word in English, is your tendency to resist being moved. So this has a high inertia, and this has a relatively lower inertia. And the inertia looks like the mass times the size squared, the radius squared, times some factor which measures how concentrated the mass is. And for this case, that factor is two-fifths, but for the hollow case, it's bigger, it's two-thirds. So you can now see, I hope, a clue as to why the tightrope walker carries the long pole. What the tightrope walker is doing is increasing his inertia. He's moving mass far away from his center and the wire. Sometimes you see tightrope walkers and they have weights on the end uh, of the, the pole, buckets with sand in that makes it even better. The inertia is even larger. So by having the long pole, you increase your inertia so that when you wobble, you wobble more slowly and you have more time to correct your feet and restore your balance. So you can try this yourself if you want to stand uh, still. It can be difficult. Put one foot in front of the other 
okay? Put your arms by your side. It's not so easy to stand completely still. But if you put your arms out, it is much easier because you're increasing your inertia and you're moving more slowly. If you watch carefully many sports, you see exactly the same effect coming into play. Here's Bradley Wiggins, triple Olympic gold medalist in cycling, and he won the Tour de France two years ago also. And on the track in the velodrome, he's using a bicycle that has solid disc wheels. So why would you do that? Uh, you can't ride in the street with wheels like that because as soon as you move the wheel against the wind, it will spin round and you will fall over. But on the track, you are always at 90 degrees to the surface of the track. But this wheel is solid. It has a smaller inertia than a wheel that has all the mass in the rim and very small spokes. In fact, the inertia is one half that of an ordinary bicycle wheel. So when he pushes down on the pedals, the inertia of the wheel is lower, it responds quicker. If you want to cycle on the road, you can do that with your back wheel, which is fixed, so that's a low inertia wheel. On the front, you can't do it. You can only reduce the inertia by dropping the weight of the wheel, reducing its mass. This type of trick you see also uh, in motion in three dimensions. Uh, and uh, if you have an object like this racket, for example, here, like any three-dimensional object, the human body, uh, it has got three different distributions of inertia. So uh, there is a distribution uh, in this direction from side to side. There is also a an up-down distribution, which is very narrow, uh, and there is a distribution sort of in this direction. So we can rotate this in three ways. We can rotate it like that, we can rotate it like that, and we can rotate it round like that. And in each case, the distribution of how far the mass is away from the center will determine the nature of the rotation. Now, there's a remarkable theorem of mathematics that was proved by Leonard Euler uh, 200 years ago, and that is we know that one of these inertias, one of the three will be the biggest, and one will be the smallest. And in between, there is an intermediate inertia. And if you rotate the racket around the axis where the inertia is intermediate, the rotation is unstable and it will flip. So if I spin this like that, the rotation is uh, obviously okay. But if I rotate it about the intermediate axis, so this is up, if I throw it up, that's now down. So the rotation has done a flip, it's now up. So that's rotation about the intermediate axis. So if you're a gymnast, uh, you can exploit this to your advantage. And if you watch highboard divers and gymnasts, a lot of their event is about changing those inertias to change the rotation axis, which is intermediate. So if a gymnast does a series of somersaults uh, across the floor here, and keeps the body very tightly wound, there will be no twist. They will just spin. But if they gradually open out their body, on the last somersault, it will be a rotation around the intermediate axis, and they will do a twist and end up facing the direction from which they have just come. If you look at gymnasts on the beam, they will do a similar trick. They get more credit for doing that twist, but it's unavoidable. Okay, If you're a highboard diver, you do some tight somersaults at first, you then open your body and you will do a twist automatically. There was one rather serious application of this 
principle uh, quite a number of years ago, you know, about 35 years ago. There was a little publicized disaster on the Mir space station, International Space Station. So the space station uh, had other spacecraft coming towards it periodically to bring supplies uh, and other astronauts. And in 1977, the Russian supply vessel collided with the spacecraft, the space station. And as a result, the space station started spinning. So here's a picture of the damage. So it hit one of the sides. The space station, which is very complicated structure, starts spinning around. And uh, the problem is, what, what can you do? So the astronauts that were present were uh, moved to one end, a sort of safety section, where there was an escape ca capsule where they could leave uh, the structure if it started to break up. But there was a British mathematician and astronaut, Michael Fall, on the space station, and he realized that what needed to be done was that you needed to calculate those three inertias and the three axes for the space station so that you had some rockets that you could fire to counter the rotation. But if you fired them in the wrong direction, you might start the rotation around the intermediate axis and it would flip over and break into pieces and we would have 200,000 tons of space debris uh, orbiting the Earth, and that would be the end of the near-Earth space program. But uh, what Foles was able to do was to calculate these principal axes of inertia for the space station. NASA had never done that. Uh, there was no reason to do it. Uh, just using his laptop on board the space station, and he calculated them correctly, and worked out what was the direction in which to fire the rockets uh, so as to damp the rotation down around one of the boring axes, uh, like this one, where there's no instability, rather than the one where it's going to flip over. So this was a very serious practical use of that property. Well, I want to go on to talk about a rather different type of mathematics, now, and it's to illustrate something that mathematicians like. Mathematicians like nothing more than finding a completely new type of problem. So a problem that appears to be very different and needs a new type of argument to solve. And this problem was first posed rather casually, I think, at a conference in 1972, and it's become known as the art gallery problem. And roughly the idea is you, this is the ground plan of an art gallery. Uh, so there are pictures on the walls in different places. And you want to guard this gallery. So you want your guards or your cameras to be able to see every wall in every room. And the question is, how many cameras do you need to guarantee that? And where should you put them? So we'll assume that the cameras can oh, the guards can swivel around 360 degrees, but they don't move around. There are generalizations of this problem where you allow the guards to move around in particular ways. So uh, let's have a look uh, at a rather simple situation first of all. So suppose that you have a gallery that's simple in the sense that it's a polygon, so all the walls are straight lines, and the corners point outwards. This is what mathematicians call a convex polygon. More technically, a convex figure is if you draw a line between any two internal points, that line always stays inside the shape. Whereas a non-convex shape is like this. You could draw a line from here to here, and it goes outside the shape. So for a convex gallery, you only need one camera. And it doesn't matter where you put it. It can see everywhere. But in this gallery, it is not obvious how many cameras you need and where you should put them. 
If they're cameras or if they're guards, they're expensive. So it is good to know what is the smallest number that you need. So let's pick this gallery again. Okay, here's a funny shaped gallery. And the first thing that we could do is to divide this gallery up into triangles. So we draw lines uh, between any uh, pair of corners, okay, the dashed lines, and we can always do that to divide it up into triangles. Triangles are interesting because we know from the previous picture that only one camera is needed to watch the inside of a triangle. But some of these triangles, you could put someone there and they will be able to watch that triangle and that triangle uh, and that triangle as well. So uh, we can start with this, okay, by putting a camera in every triangle, uh, but we've got too many because some cameras are superfluous. So what we're going to do instead is to introduce what mathematicians would call a colouring. We're going to use three colours, and we'll start at one corner with one colour, pink, and then we'll colour every single corner of a triangle using the following rule. We pick a colour for the next corner so that the line joining them doesn't link corners of the same colour. So this one goes pink, say, to green. That means that has to be yellow. If we tried to pick green again or red, we would have red to red and green to green. And then down here, because we have yellow and green, this must be pink. And that means that must be green. And so this must be yellow, that must be red, so this one must be yellow because that's green. So this must be green, that must be red, that must be green. So if you just follow this simple recipe, you'll find that there is a way to colour every single corner uh, with one colour so that no two lines join points of the same colour. You now look at all the pink points, and this is one answer to our problem. If we put our cameras on the pink points, that would solve the problem. We would watch every wall. If we put the cameras on the green points, that's another solution. If we put it on the yellow points, that's another solution. But if we use the pink points, there's one, two, three, four, five, six cameras that are required. If you use the yellow ones, it's one, two, three, four, five, six again. If we use green, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's not as good. So we could use either the yellow points or the pink points for our cameras. And the general rule here is that the most cameras that you will need to solve one of these problems is worked out by taking uh, the number of sides, number of corners, call it n, dividing by 3, because we're working with triangles, and then taking the whole number part of that quantity. So in this case, we've got 19 sides and corners, so we divide 19 by 3, we get 6 and 1 third, the whole number part is 6. And we did indeed need 6. If we had uh, a convex figure that had 19 sides, we would only need 1. So this number is the most that you might need to solve the problem. So uh, in general, uh, there's a theorem of this sort that tells you that if you've got n corners in the gallery, then the whole number part of one-third n may be necessary to see 
every interior point in the gallery. So if you had 100 corners, a very large gallery, you would need 33 cameras to do the trick, to keep watch on everything. And you see, what do the worst case scenarios look like? Well, it's if you made galleries that look like this, like a comb, then this is a rather bad setup because if you put a camera in one of these Vs, they can't see anywhere else. So no camera that sees into here can see into any other of the Vs. So you end up needing to have the full number of cameras in order to watch every single V. Well, many galleries use right angles only. Okay, they don't have a completely polygonal state. So these are called orthogonal galleries. So here's an example, a bit like the last one, but everything is at right angles. This time we could com copy what we did before. Instead of drawing triangles everywhere, we could draw rectangles. And we know that just one camera is needed inside one rectangle, and we could then color the corners with four colors, carry out the same operation. And what we discover is that the number of guards that we might need is the whole number part of one quarter the number of corners. So if you had 100 corners for an orthogonal gallery, you might only need 25 guards, not 33. The other type of gallery that you encounter, uh, probably here in this building and in town, is a gallery that's rectangular, but it has a division into rooms. And the trick there is, of course, that if you stand in this entranceway between the two rooms, then a camera there can watch the two rooms at once. So this is a much more economical setup if you think about it, again, the number of cameras or guards that you would need is just the whole number part of one half of the number of rooms. So this arrangement here has got eight rooms, and it needs four guards. You can put them here, 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 and here. As I said earlier, there is a whole generalization of problems of this sort to take into account galleries where you have objects in the middle of a room that stop you seeing from one side to the other, situations where the guards are allowed to move around or the cameras can be moved, and also uh, another set of problems which are interested in keeping watch on the outside of a structure. So it's a bit like having a prison and wanting to know how many cameras that you need to watch the outside of the walls, and maybe the outside and the inside. OK, let's look at something uh, more familiar. Uh, how can mathematics tell you something about the best way to board passengers uh, onto an airplane? So if you've traveled from Perugia uh, on Ryanair, uh, then you'll know about uh, chaotic situations for boarding aircraft, and it's possible to have uh, a bad arrangement to board aircraft. What is interesting about aircraft boarding until rather recently, when there was a more mathematical input to the problem, is that it's fairly intuitively obvious what the worst way to board an aircraft would be. So you would board all the people in the front seats first, and then the people in the middle next, and the people at the back last and they would all get in the way of each other. And because that seems to be the worst, airlines always assumed that the best solution must be the opposite, to board people from the back, then in the middle, and then at the front. Turns out this is actually the second worst strategy that you could use. So on this slide are some pictures from uh, sort of airline uh, systems. So the first system that you might have, this is first class passengers, so they're always supposed to go on first. 
uh, and then these are all the other economy seats behind. Well, the first system that you could have, which is a bit like Ryanair in the past, completely random, you know, so people just get on uh, random regardless of where they sit. Um, and if they have numbered seats here, we're assuming they have numbered seats, uh, then there's a sort of battle to find your way to seats. The second is the more common system where you board the people at the back first. Then the yellows are second, the orange a third, and the pink fourth, and so on. So you board from the back to the front. So another system, you see, that sort of rotates this a bit. So you, you board the back first, then the front second, then third, fourth, fifth. So it's a sort of rotating system, try and keep people out of each other's way. And uh, this is a more sophisticated thing, a reverse pyramid. You board some people on the outside first, uh, and then uh, on the inside, and then some people here, and people here, and then the people down the aisle. And the interesting question that was posed uh, by Jason Steffen in Chicago a few years ago was to try and explore what is the optimal way of boarding the plane. And it turns out that the key consideration is not really whether people are at the back or at the front, but first of all, whether they should be sitting by the window and by the aisle, but secondly and most importantly, have they got room to get out of the way of other people? And the key factor there, in this example around here, where you're boarding, first of all, the person at the back row by the window, and then the person two rows in front, and then two rows in front of that. So it's like saying we board all the people in the even-numbered rows in the window seats. Because when you do that, there is a free row between everybody for people to get out of the way and allow people past. So the trick is to board every other row and best to board the people in the window seats first and then the middle uh, and then uh, the aisle. And here's a little uh, picture of what happened with numerical simulations and then uh, with real people. So the first uh, would be the current system. Here's the back. Boarding, here's the central aisle. You board people at the back first then in the middle, then at the front. So this was taking 6 minutes and 54 seconds in the trial with people with average luggage and usual problems. Here's uh, a situation, uh, a timing where you uh, board people at random. Turns out to be much better. They get on much quicker at random than in the back to front system. Why is that? Well, oddly, it's because at random, people do sometimes find that there's nobody in the row on either side, and they can get out of the way, and that stops the blockage. The next method, this uh, sort of Wilma method, so you board people uh, along the edges, okay, in the window seats, then in the middle, then in the aisle. So this is pretty good. It's better than random. It's much better than block boarding. But Stefan's method... Uh, to sort of statistical mechanic study method where you go with every other row boarded first, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and then you pick on people in the next and then the middle. It's easily the best. It's almost half as quick as the block and back to front boarding. So again, an example of how some mathematical and statistical insight and study gives you an optimal solution to a problem that you wouldn't really have thought of as being a mathematical problem. Next, let me tell you something about uh, probability and statistics, which always uh, really rather shocks people. They'll never believe the result. This is uh, something that's known amongst mathematicians as the Monty Hall problem, or the three-box problem. Monty Hall, because Monty Hall was someone in America who hosted a television game show. And the most famous game that was ever played on this show uh, relies on a subtlety of probability. What the game was, you had three boxes. And in one box, there is a car as a prize. 
So a sports car. And in the other two boxes, there are goats. Okay? And you have to choose the box that has the car in, unless you're a goat farmer and you really like goats rather than cars. But the idea is that people want to win the car. So you make a choice of a box, and then something interesting happens. The host, Mr. Monty Hall, who goes round the back, he can see what's in what box. And he opens one of the other boxes that you have not chosen, that has, not, that has a goat in it. And he shows it to you. And he asks you, do you want to stick with your original choice, or do you want to swap to the other box? And most people think, it can't possibly make any difference. You know, I made my choice. The car is in the box that it's in. You know, why would I swap? But in fact, if you swap, you double the chance that you will win the car. So how is that? Well, suppose here are the three boxes, okay, and you've chosen uh, one of these boxes, okay, and you ask, well, what's the probability that uh, you pick the car correctly? Well, it's one in three, okay. Now, what happens is that Mr. Monty Hall adds new information because he's looking at the boxes and he opens one where there is no car. So he's telling you something. So of those other two boxes, there's a two-thirds, a two-in-three chance uh, that the car is in those two boxes. There's a one-in-three chance it's in the one you've chosen. Well, if he opens one of the boxes and there's nothing in it, then the whole two-thirds probability of being in those two boxes is now in the other box, and the probability is zero that it's in the open box. So it's still probability one in three that it's in the one you first chose, but there's a probability of two in three if you switch to the other box. So you should always switch. You will double the chance that you will win the car if you switch. So it seems very counterintuitive. If you imagine, first of all, there was a hundred boxes, and he opened nine, he opened one of uh, of the others. He opened all except one, and they were all empty. And you said, "No, I'm going to stick with my original box." You would be trying to persuade yourself that you had correctly chosen from the hundred boxes with a one in a hundred chance the first time. But he has shown you 98 empty boxes. And you still don't believe that if you switched, you would do better. So you should always switch. Lastly, a last type of mechanics problem that looks very odd. Um, can you ride a bike with square wheels? Well, uh, you can, but not on an ordinary road. Uh, and here's a little picture of how you can do it. So what do you mean by ride smoothly? Well, we mean the obvious thing is that your center of gravity moves along a horizontal line. Whoops, lost that. There we go. Um, so in the case of an ordinary bicycle and a flat road with circular tires, that's generally what happens. But you can imagine that if you have a square wheel, is there a shape of road surface so that the center of the wheel moves in a horizontal line, nonetheless? And there is. And here's the mathematical formula for the shape. And it's a shape that's familiar. So if you see a hanging chain hanging between two points, it hangs in the shape of a catenary, a curve which is uh, the cosh or the hyperbolic cosine. Uh, of x, the distance along here. If we turn this upside down, we turn the hanging chain or the catenary upside down and then copy it again and again, we have this surface. And what is special about this surface is that if you were to measure this angle in here, where one catenary meets the other, it's 90 degrees. And so if you make the size of the square wheel right, then when it drops into this little glitch here, 
So if we go forward, it exactly fits into the 90 degrees. And we can do the same thing for a wheel that has the shape of any polygon. So it is perfectly possible uh, to make a bicycle with square wheels. And here's a little picture of Stan Wagon, who built this example, uh, driving it smoothly along a surface with the square wheels. So that's all we've really got time for. I hope that I've given you some flavor of how mathematical thinking can answer questions that you might not have thought were within the domain of mathematics. So mathematics has something to teach us about many areas of the natural world. We saw in sports, uh, in mechanics, in everyday life, in probability, in making stable structures. And I hope this has enlarged a little bit your picture of what mathematics can do and what it can tell you. Thank you. If there is somebody who wants to ask something to Professor Barrow, please come here and uh, put a question. You won't get them to come up here. They might talk into a roving microphone. I think they won't ask us. Yes. Uh, so in Italian, so there are questions, please. passando una ragazza con il microfono basta che alzate la mano e è possibile porre una domanda uh, hi I would uh, want to ask you uh, what do you suggest to the boy like us that um, want to, to take a university and um, what kind of program of engineering do you suggest to, to us? Well, I'm not sure what the school system is like in Italy, but in England you don't study engineering at school. So... Um, People who want to study engineering at university will study mathematics and physics and maybe other subjects at school level. And I think as a general rule, you, you probably can't do too much mathematics in preparation for engineering. It's unusual that many people choose engineering instead of physics because they think it is less mathematical. But I think engineering is probably more mathematical in the first year uh, of a university course. Uh, even than physics, because you do many, many mathematical methods. Um, uh, of course, today engineering is a very different subject than it used to be. Uh, there are problems of nanotechnology and electrical engineering, computer engineering, uh, science of new materials that are very, very close to physics uh, and even biotechnical, uh, bioengineering problems. So engineering is a vast subject with many of these specializations, but all require quite high-level mathematics eventually. So uh, I think if you do as much mathematics as you can, 
at high school, you really maximize the number of things that you're going to be able to do. Uh, because many of the subjects that you like or which will interest you or be important in the future, you haven't even encountered them yet. Uh, you don't know anything about them. So you've, you've got to just make sure that you know the basic tools of mathematics uh, and physics and maybe of chemistry that ensure that you have the maximum possible choice. I think in England, on average, engineers have the highest salaries uh, on graduation uh, than, than any other profession. When you have average over all the members of the profession, uh, also there's probably more job opportunities in engineering than any other field at present. There's generally a shortage of engineers uh, in Britain, well-qualified engineers, uh, more jobs than there are engineers. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello. I'd like to do a question about uh, maths. Because... Prova. Prova. That's it. That's Good. it. I like to do a question about uh, math, math, because because uh, can you apply maths about humanistic subjects? And if you can apply this subject, this logic subject, how can you explain human relationships? Yeah, so the, let me repeat the question. He was asking, can you apply mathematics to uh, the humanities, subjects to humanities and uh, also sort of human I interactions? So in, there are many interesting problems in the humanities where mathematics tells you uh, important things. The whole area of design uh, and art is highly geometrical and mathematical. But if you're involved in linguistic analysis, for example, of texts, wanting to discover if an ancient text uh, or a work that someone claims is by Shakespeare, uh, is it really by Shakespeare, how do you tell? Then a mathematical analysis of the statistics uh, of the word structure and the word use tells you important things. And this was, in fact, first invented by a mathematician called Markov back in 1905, uh, who studied how sequences of random events are linked to one another. So like uh, if we want to know what's the chance that it will rain tomorrow, that is not independent of the weather today. So if you know the probability that it will rain tomorrow if it's sunny today, the probability it will rain tomorrow if it rains today, you can then make predictions about the likelihood of it raining any number of days ahead. Uh, so uh, in the situation of human relationships, so it might be something like economics. So how are people behaving when you make an announcement that interest rates are going to be higher? Or if you make an announcement about a voter's opinion poll. This changes the way people vote. So if you make the vote, voter's opinion poll public, it will change how people uh, behave. So you can, there are attempts to study such problems. I think mathematics is less successful in those types of problem because they are much more complicated than the problems of physics. So they involve many people interacting with one another and they involve people responding to the actions of other people. So mathematics is useful to some extent in social sciences and financial sciences but not as useful as it's turned out to be in physics uh, and the study of the astronomical world. And the reason is because the social science problems of human interactions are much more complicated. And they can't just be solved by pencil and paper. Uh, numerical simulation with computers enables you to see what will happen if somebody acts in this way, what will be the effect on all the other people. Let me give you a simple example in biology. Suppose that you have a group of animals, antelope, and they're in Africa and they're huddling together, and a lion appears 
on the edge of their view. So what do they do? They move, but in a very complicated way. So each of the animals wants to move so that there is another animal in between them and the lion. So that when the lion looks in their direction for something to eat, it sees the other animal, not them. So they're all moving in this way. And it's like a great dance. And you can study this with a computer, but you wouldn't get very far with pencil and paper. So this is a typical type of social problem where people respond to the next thing that's done and change how they're behaving. Okay. I think they are exhausted. <laughs> well, just uh, one question can I ask about uh, uh, airplane companies uh, uh, which do not use uh, the Stefan scheme. Why do they not use this uh, optimal scheme? Perhaps they do not believe in mathematics either, or either they do not know this uh, solution to be the best one. Yes, I think uh, some have started to use this. And in fact, Stefan patented his solution. So you have to pay him, the airlines would have to pay him uh, in order to adopt his, his solution. Um, but they should be happy to do that. Uh, there's someone... Grazie. La domanda è in italiano. Qual è il rapporto eh, della matematica eh, nello studio dell'universo e in particolare l'imprevedibilità oggi come viene affrontato? Ossia se l'universo è eh, mat matematicamente conoscibile ehm, c'è qualcosa di imprevedibile, qualcosa che lo scienziato neanche con una probabilità può ancora conoscere o comunque approdare? Yes. Is it predictable or it is unpredictable? It is possible that we cannot uh, predict something in the universe uh, even uh, with mathematics. Yeah. Yes, there are lots of things that in practice you can't predict about the universe or even in your laboratory. They fall into two sorts, really. There are things which are unpredictable uh, in principle. So these are perhaps events where there is a quantum effect of quantum mechanics involved. So these are intrinsically random. So you cannot predict when a particular radioactive nucleus will decay. So this is not uh, ignorance which is just because you don't have enough information. Uh, it is not possible in principle to make such a prediction. The information doesn't exist to be found. But there is another type of unpredictability in practice. There are many uh, natural events like the weather, for example, where the future behavior is very, very sensitive to the present behavior. So if you make a very tiny error or have a very tiny uncertainty in describing the present state of affairs, that by tomorrow this uncertainty will have grown enormously. Uh, so if, for example, you just have a clock face and you're moving a hand around the clock by doubling the angle at which the point uh, sits, then you could apply this rule any number of times exactly and you would know exactly where the point was on the clock face. But if you had a little uncertainty of where the hand was at the beginning, that uncertainty would double each time you applied the rule. And very soon the uncertainty would be bigger than 360 degrees, the entire clock face, and you wouldn't know anything about the position of the point. So many of these problems in social sciences that were just mentioned, financial developments, as well as the weather, they're unpredictable in practice because the small uncertainties grow bigger and bigger and bigger. So if your Prime Minister makes a prediction about what the economy is going to do tomorrow, uh, you might believe some of it. 
But if he makes a prediction about what's going to happen in one month, you probably wouldn't believe any of it. Uh, uh, similarly with the weather. Um, you might predict the weather tomorrow or two days' time, but you couldn't predict the weather in a month's time. So it's just uh, too much uncertainty which grows too quickly. By having faster and faster computers, you can delay the time when the uncertainty grows unacceptably large. But you can never remove it. So some motions of objects in the universe are like that, but uh, it's really local complicated events, like weather, uh, social interaction, putting some ink in a, a glass of water uh, and stirring it a little bit. If two points are close together, then after you've stirred them, they will soon become very far apart. And you will not be able to work out where they started from. Hi, Professor. Uh, one, 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 excuse me. One question. Uh, mathematics is everywhere. You can explain everything with mathematics. But do you think uh, um, is something that you cannot explain with mathematics formulas? Uh, mathematics uh, can be. In, uh, can development in, in another kind of uh, things. I don't know if I'm, uh, I explain very well what, what I want to say to you, but uh, what is the new frontier of mathematics from now to the future? Yeah, I think it, um, I would say, not that you can explain everything with mathematics, but you can describe everything with mathematics. And sometimes describing it with mathematics allows you then to figure out what's going to happen in the future uh, and to learn things that you wouldn't be able to learn. But sometimes describing something in mathematics doesn't lead to anything new at all. It's not useful. So um, if you uh, gave a, uh, an algebraic letter to each one of your friends um, and you said that they were a set of friends, this wouldn't actually tell you anything terribly useful at all about them. It's just a way of describing them. So sometimes mathematics can be used in a rather useless way like that, uh, just like a translation into a new language. But sometimes when you study, for example, the description of where the motions of the planets are in the solar system, that when you describe that mathematically, it enables you to predict the future to predict where they will be tomorrow and next year with very great accuracy. So the world is this interesting division between predictable simple problems and problems which in practice are not terribly predictable. So sometimes mathematics is not very useful. So it, it can't tell you why you like your friends and then there are some other people that you don't like. Um, and we know that there are certain qualities of things, like for example, um, a person's height. So if person A is taller than person B, and person B is taller than person C, then necessarily person A is taller than person C. But if person A likes person B, and person B likes person C, that doesn't guarantee that person A will like person C. And if football team A beat football team B, football team B beats football team C, doesn't mean that football team A will beat football team C. So, um, so part of the art of mathematics is picking the right problems and applying the right mathematics uh, and not just using mathematics to describe.
Okay, maybe we end. Okay. Last one. If the, uh, se non ci sono altre domande, ringraziamo il professor Barro. Thank you, professor, for our answers. Okay.